revival uh, because I'm an unusual person. And um, that's not kidding. I, I am. You just asked my wife. Um, the thing that God has blessed me with the most, I think, is discovery of the things that are in the Word of God. This Bible has more in it than you could possibly fathom. We will never, I foolishly years ago, as God was showing me things from his word, I remember saying, God just showed all to me, showed all, I want it all. That was foolishness because the older I get, the more I realize that if I lived a dozen lifetimes in this world, I will never pull out of this book everything that's in it. The more you read this Bible, the more you learn, and the more you learn, the more you're hungry to read more of the Word of God, and that's just how it works. And so uh, the Bible, when talking about revival, the Bible says that we are renewed in knowledge. And so God wants to take what it is that you know now, and he wants to add to it, whether he uses me or he uses Brother Joshua or he uses any, any of his good men. You mentioned Brother Reg Kelly. First time that I ever sat and listened to Reg Kelly, God had just really taken my life at that time and was reshaping me, remolding me. You mentioned a rock concert, and I was going to have one of those in my church. And God whooped the daylights out of me over that. I finally, I canceled it, didn't have it. Um, but God was at that time was in the process of remolding me, reshaping me as a, as a young man, as a young pastor. And um, so we go down to um, Harrison, Arkansas, Oak Lane Free Will Baptist Church. And Brother Reg is preaching down there. And he's, gonna, he's preaching this message called David's Mighty Men. I don't know if you've ever heard it. Fantastic message. I have it up on YouTube if you want to look it up and watch it. Just don't watch it tonight while I'm doing this, okay? But anyway, after the first hour of listening to him, I was, I was furious. I was mad. I'm going, he can't say stuff like that. He can't preach like that. Like that. Meanwhile, my wife goes, boom, how come you don't preach like that? Am I making that up? No, sir, I'm not making that up. Now I'm furious. And I listened to him for another hour. But you know what? I got the recording of that sermon, that message. He preached several times that weekend, and I've got all the recordings from it. I've listened to that sermon, David's Mighty Men, probably 30, 40 times. I could tell you just about every word that he says in it. And what God was doing was God was showing me, Mike, I put you in a position to say things, and if some people don't like it, that's just too bad. All of the prophets that we read about in the Bible... They had people that hated their guts, wanted them dead. Jezebel, she had her list of men that she wanted dead. Ahab didn't want to call Micaiah, the prophet, to come in because he said, he never tells me what I want to hear. I don't like him. But sure enough, Micaiah had the word of the Lord, and Micaiah was going to reveal just exactly how everything was going to go down. And so God used this man and a lot of other good men at the time to really shape me and to, and to help me understand, Mike, you're in the position to tell what I said in my word. Some people are going to love it. Some people are going to like it. They're going to think this is great. And other people, you're going to be their enemies until the day you die. And I, what I wanted was to make everybody like me. I'm, I want everybody to like me. I want everybody to invite me back. And that's, that's what I want. But that's not possible if you take the responsibility that God gives you and take this word in your hand and go tell people what it is in some cases that they absolutely don't want to hear. In some cases, I've had people, <laughs> my own brother-in-law, uh, threaten to beat me up on at least two occasions. But you know what? God finally saved that man. He's in heaven right now. And so it does pay off. If you look, now, I'm going to, almost everything I do this week is going to be up on the screen. Now, I know some preachers call that that off-the-wall preaching. But there's a reason why I do this. I'm going to throw so many scripture verses at you. And if you like to write them down as a preacher's preaching them, just give it up, okay? That's the reason why we brought the DVDs back there on the table back in that uh, foyer area back there. Uh, we have a table full of videos. We started doing this not too long after I started this ministry in 19, or excuse me, in 2009. And um, we've, I don't, I can't 
imagine how many DVDs we have given away. We don't sell them. We never have. Uh, we give them away. People have responded to that. They give to us and we just keep making more DVDs and putting them on uh, YouTube and putting them on Facebook. Wherever there's people going to be, that's where we want to be. And uh, so go back there after I'm done and get as many DVDs as you want. Don't worry about it. We will make more. All right. We never run out of DVDs and they're on various subjects that I'm going to be talking about this week. Also, if you have a personal computer, a laptop, a desktop, anything like that, whether it's a Macintosh or whether it's a Windows machine, you got to get this software. This is the King James Pure Bible Search software. It does one thing. It searches the King James Bible, and that's it. And I promise you, you'll have more fun than people should be allowed to have by searching things out in the Scripture. I, I could give you words to search out, and I promise you, if you go home, put this in your computer, you'll be up to 1, 2 o'clock in the morning and discovering things that are in God's Word that you never knew were there before. So hopefully, hopefully, if the Lord blesses this week, then you're going to see that this Bible is much more than you could have ever possibly imagined. Jeremiah 33, 2 says, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, God made us, the Lord that formed it, to establish it. The Lord is his name. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Do you believe the Bible tonight? Yes. All right, because that's important, because I'm going to say some things this weekend, or this, yeah, this weekend, that you may have never heard before, may have never thought before, but I'm going to keep asking that question, do you believe the Word of God? So my favorite verse, Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and shew thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. So in 1997, I had been pastor of Bethel Church for a year. That's my home church. I grew up in that church. I've been going to that church since 1974. I think I was eight years old at the time. And uh, other than three years in Bible college and three years pastoring a, a little community church sort of like this one, uh, I've been at Bethel all my life. And uh, in 1997, the Lord laid it on my heart to study Bible prophecy. And I thought, well, that's great. I'm going to go buy a bunch of books on Bible prophecy. There were some new ones that had just come out. And I thought, I'm going to go read those books. And God said, hold on. I wrote a book on Bible prophecy. I went, that is amazing. It did. It's like it hit me like, boy, he did, didn't he? Because I had a bad habit of getting these books on prophecy, and I would read what the author said, and whenever they put scripture there, I'm just telling you, I had a bad habit. And I, my bad habit was I'd skip, I'd skip over the scripture because I'd say, I already know that. But I wanted to hear what the author said. And now God's turned me around. If you give me a book on anything and it's got scripture in it, I want to see the scripture first. I'm not interested in what man says. I want to see what God says. And so one of the first things that I did as I'm doing this study, and God's going to show me in his word, I decided to throw out everything that I thought I already knew. I cast it aside because if you go to God and you already know something, God's going to say, okay, well, there's no sense in teaching you that. But if you go to him and say, God, you put it in me the way you want it in me, I guarantee you, if you call upon him, he will answer you and show you great and mighty things. Not that you already know, but things that you know not. So this week, we're going to go to the University of Hoggard. All right. Or as they call it, you hog. <laughs> Amos 3, surely the Lord God will do nothing. But he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. His servants, the prophets, are here in this book from Genesis to Revelation, 1189 chapters. Yes, I've counted them. And I've even counted things because numbers do not what? Lie. And I'm going to show you some things about one Bible in particular, and that is the, what they call the Authorized Bible, the King James Bible. When I got into this study in 97, uh, I had been to three years of Bible college, and they taught me that there was errors and mistakes in all the translations, and that I really needed to learn Hebrew and Greek so that I could properly translate the Bible. Uh, but that's not how I was raised. How I was raised was we use one Bible, and that's the King James.
But I let my Bible college professors and the student body talk me out of that and move me away from that, and it had bad consequences in my life. And so as God is going to show me these things in his word, it never dawned on me that it would be out of one Bible in particular until somewhere in 1998. I don't remember the day, but I remember the thought process that God led me down on this road. And I was just sitting in my office thinking and meditating on God's word. And finally, the Holy Spirit said, Mike, you know, this Bible's right. And, and it was this Bible. Not the NIV, not the New American Standard, not the English Standard or the Holman Christian Standard. None of those. It's the King James. Now, I immediately accepted that. When God speaks to you, you know it. My sheep know my voice. And I surrendered to it, just like I surrendered to salvation. But I said, God, I believe you. But can I have evidence? Can I have proof? God doesn't have a problem with that. And so God began to, over the years, to begin to supply me with the evidence and the proof. And one of those is in Numbers. Now, in Ecclesiastes 7, if you want to turn there and make a little note in your Bible on this, what I'm going to show you, you can. Ecclesiastes 7, Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, okay? And Solomon writes, basically, he's a man, guys. Solomon's a man, and he's a rich man, which means he can have whatever he wants. Well, Solomon had everything that every one of us men could have ever wanted in our lifetime. He had money, unlimited money. He had power. Uh, there wasn't a, a nation anywhere in the world that was going to take Israel to war after, their, after David had done beat them all. In fact, we, have, we know that nations around the world came all the way to Israel to pay homage to King Solomon and his wisdom and basically to pay him money saying, please don't attack us. Okay, because they knew he'd win. He had, get this, he had all the women that any man could ever lust after. 700 wives, 300 concubines, I'd say that pretty much covers it. And he had all of that. Snap his fingers, and he's got a woman. Snap his fingers again, he's got two or three of them. He's literally got, he's got money, he's got power, he's got women. He had music playing all the time. He, it took him seven years to build God's house, took him 13 years to build his own. So he's got the nicest palace in the world. He literally has everything. And for 40 years, he sits and God let him retain his wisdom. And he's watching all this. And even though he's uh, uh, burning incense to all these wives, false gods, he is still retaining his wisdom. And you know what he says in the book of Ecclesiastes? After 40 years of living like this, it's vanity. It's vexation. He said, I'm going to die and what's going to happen to me is the same thing that happens to any of the beasts that I own or any of the slaves that I own. We all turn to dust. And, I, and I'll, I'll add this to it. I've never seen a hearse headed out one day with a U-Haul behind it. You cannot take it with you. So when the richest man in the world dies, he is exactly the same as you and I. Amen. So he writes and he warns us men. I've had it. Everything you wanted, I had. And it will not bring you happiness. So don't try to chase that down as the goal in your life. You want, to, you want something to achieve? Work for God. Amen. So he said in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 25, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of fool and madness. So in verse 25, he says, I'm, I'm seeking out wisdom. I want to know where wisdom is. Two verses later in verse 27, he says, behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. So here Solomon says, I'm, I'm looking for wisdom. And he said, I found it by counting. Counting gave me wisdom. Uh, one by one to find out the account. Now, Ecclesiastes 7, you might want to write this down, is the 666th chapter of the Bible. And see, I went there. I'm going, I wonder what the 666th chapter of the Bible is. I bet I find the name of the beast in there. So I read all of Ecclesiastes 7 and I'm going, no, I didn't find that. But what I found was a double witness. 
So if we go to Revelation 13, 18, here is wisdom. What was it Solomon was looking for? Wisdom. He said, here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding do what? Count the number. It's the same thing that Solomon said. Count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three scored and six. So you've got two witnesses in your Bible. That's the requirement. One Old Testament, one New Testament. Both of you are telling you that if you want wisdom, both of them tell you that you'll find it by counting things. So let me put a number up here on the screen. And this is the number. Can you find the number 33 up here? Okay, that's easy. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. Now, why would I pick out the number 33? It, yeah, it's how old Christ was. We know that by the Passovers and so on, that he was 33 years old. And there's a reason for that. There is such a cool, I don't know if I'll have enough time to get out everything I want to get out this week. But anyway, if you find yourself still here tonight at 1030, amen, just remember, I don't have to get up and bail hay tomorrow morning, milk cows, go to, go to the plant. I don't have to do anything, all right? God is not the author of, what does an author do? Writes books. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Isn't Christ the prince of peace? You find that in verse 33. So, if I were to ask you, give me a number that you think is one of the most significant numbers in the whole Bible. What would you say? Seven. seven. Everybody says seven. I'll take seven. Thank you very much. So, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the seventh chapter of the Bible. I want somebody to find the 70th chapter of the Bible. Okay. And I would give you a hint, but I just don't feel like it tonight. I'm going to make you find it on your own. You find the seventh chapter of the Bible. That should be pretty easy. Now find the 70th chapter of the Bible. And we're going to look at what. So what would you say the number seven represents? Completion. Completion. What else? Completion. The number seven. Sabbath day. Sabbath day. Very good. That has to do with completion, but it also has to do with what the Sabbath day is. When God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. holy. So the number seven is going to represent holiness as well. So let's look at how God defined the number seven. He did it all the way back in Genesis 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. That's completion. All the host of them, and on the seventh day, God ended. There it is again. His, see, we didn't just make these number meanings up. God was careful that when he gives a number in the Bible, he also tells you what that number means. So in this seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And then God blessed it. And the seventh day, and God sanctified. That's why he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He didn't say to make it holy. He's already made it holy. He sanctified it. So the number seven represents completion, finish, finished, perfection. I mean, if God said there's seven days in a week, there's seven days in a week. Amen. Man has tried unsuccessfully for years to change how long a week is, and it never works out. It's always stuck at seven. And because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which he had created and made. So now, what do you think God is going to do in the seventh chapter of the Bible? Based on what we just learned, what do you think God's going to do? Destroy the world. Look at here. For yet how many days? And I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And there's a reason why he picked 40 here too. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. So on day seven, or excuse me, in the seventh chapter of the Bible, God ended the old world that uh, Peter talked about in Second Peter, the world that then was. And so if seven is the number for completion and things ending, what would the number eight be if you were to take a guess? If do what? Okay, like a new 
beginning because seventh day, Saturday, the weekends, the eighth day is Sunday, but it's also the first day, but it's also the eighth day. So it's starting all over again, isn't it? So eight is a number for starting over. So if I tell you that not only did God end the world in the seventh chapter of the Bible, he started it back again in the eighth chapter of the Bible with eight people coming off the ark. Amen. Doodads just went up and down my back. Isn't that amazing? So how many of you have seen something that you never saw before in your Bible? Say amen. amen. All right, I got half of you. I'm going to work on the other half, all right? So did we ever... Uh, did we ever get to that 70th chapter yet? Oh, this is math. This is like third grade math. Genesis 20. I didn't say you had to count every stinking chapter. But let's, let's work this out in our mind. Let's do some algebra here. Okay? Genesis has how many chapters? 50. So, we only need 20 more chapters, don't we? So, 50 plus 20 is 70. So, 50 is Genesis. Where does that take us to? Exodus 20. So, turn to, turn to the 70th chapter of the Bible. Exodus 20. See how easy that was? Y'all thought you were going one, two, three... Four. See, they're already numbered on the page for you. And listen, as far as Bible study, we've got it easy nowadays, don't we? I mean, God, God numbered all the chapters for us so we don't, we don't have to look around. He numbered all the verses for us so we can find it easy. Then we walk around with these computers in our hand that are more powerful than the one that we sent men to the moon with. And we have Bible apps on every one of them. And it's so easy to search. The Bereans, when they searched the scriptures, it must have taken them months to figure out whether the apostles were lying or not. We can find it out in a matter of minutes. And yet there's more ignorance of what the Bible has in it now than I think at any other time before. Probably because with those, those computers that we have, there's a lot more other things that occupy our mind with those things. And we just don't have time to read the Bible anymore. That is a shame. In Genesis 29, God said, fulfill her week. This is, um, uh, uh, who is this, J uh, uh, Jacob. And he's going to marry uh, Rachel, but he ends up with uh, the ugly sister first. Amen. Fulfill her week, and we will give thee also this for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet seven other years. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. And so a week has seven days in it. And by the way, the word week or weeks is found exactly 28 times in the King James Bible. That's seven times four. See, I started finding stuff like this. Words or phrases that would be found seven times or multiples of seven times. And they actually, they actually deal with what the meaning of that number is. Um, here in Deuteronomy, we're given uh, the layout for like the Feast of, of, of uh, Pentecost, the end gathering, seven weeks. So when you have seven weeks, you have 49 days, shalt thou number unto thee, and so on and so on. And then in Daniel chapter 9, we have 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. 70 weeks would be seven days in a week times 70. That would be 490. By the way, is there another place in the Bible that we can uh, find that, that uh, equation 70 times 7? The disciples came to him and said, how often, if our brother offend us, how often should we forgive him? Until seven times? What did Jesus say? Until 70 times seven. So look in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Open your Bible up there and look at that. I've actually got them numbered here for you. During this 490 days, God's going to do exactly seven things with Israel. And watch this. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. 
God's going to do seven things with Israel, and most of them have to do with forgiving her sins. So now you might understand. See how, see how the Bible's pulling these two things together. Here in Daniel, 70 times 7, 490, and God does seven things, which includes forgiving the sins of Christ's brethren, Israel. And then... They ask him, Lord, how often shall we forgive our brother? Until seven times? Yea, until 70 times. See, Jesus already knew what was in Daniel 9, didn't he? Because he wrote it. He is it. Amen. He already knew. So now these two ideas are tied together. Now when Jesus, now we sort of know why Jesus said 70 times seven. Mm -mm -mm. By the way, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a dollar bill out of my own wallet if you can turn to the 490th chapter of the Bible. Dollar bill now. You're going to wait until I tell you what it is, ain't you? Genesis chapter 2, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. The word finished is also found 42 times in the King James Bible, 7 times 6. How about this one? God rested on the seventh day. The word rested is mentioned 21 times, seven times three. The phrase seven day or seventh month is mentioned exactly 77 times in the Old Testament. Seventh day, seventh month, they deal with the number seven. You add them together, both of them together found 77 times in the, in the Old Testament of the King James. God mentions that which is the Sabbath in it, there shall be none. The word Sabbath is also mentioned 77 times in the Old Testament. And Sabbath is the seventh day. How about this one? And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of the year shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Well, the phrase seven times is mentioned 35 times in the Bible, seven times five. Seven years is mentioned 42 times, that's seven times six. If you add them together, that's 77. Mm, 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 mm. How about this one? For yet seven days, and I will cause it the rain. The phrase seven days is mentioned 98 times which is seven times seven times two. So they all make this number become real and become alive. Tell you what, turn your Bible to Psalm 12. Psalm 12. Mm -mm -mm. Am I boring you yet? All right. In a little bit, we'll change keys here. We'll go from talking numbers to talking something else. Psalm chapter 12. Are you there? Say amen. amen. You can write next to this chapter, 490th chapter. You see, the software that I, that I want you to take home, it'll do that for you. You just give it a number, and it'll take you right to that number of chapter. Okay. Now, the software was written a few years ago by a lady that follows our ministry. She wrote it absolutely for free. It's free software. You can give it away as all, all you want to. Uh, when I started counting things, I had to kind of do it. I made me a little spreadsheet, and I put how many chapters were in each book of the Bible, and I kept a running total. So if I wanted to find like the 777th chapter of the Bible, and then I would look and see, you know, where one book ended and where the other book ended. And I knew it was in between there. So then I did the counting. But it's, by the way, it's Jeremiah 32. And I might show you what is significant about that. But Psalm chapter 12. Let's look here at, uh, let's, let's read this whole chapter. It's not very long. Help, Lord, for the, un, uh, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. How, how many of you in, you in your lifetime has seen righteousness fail in this country? You better believe it. Number two, verse two, they speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and with a double heart. Do they speak? Sounds like politicians, me. And some preacher, well, a lot of preachers. Verse 3, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. You see, God knew that in that day that I was going to have that rock concert in my church, that all I wanted to do was flatter the people in my church so that I could get more people in. By getting more people in the church, then I could get more money out of them. I'm just being honest with you. That's where my heart was at the time. 
It's a wonder God didn't kill me, but he just whooped me. That was bad enough. Amen. But he said, uh, verse 4, with, who have said with our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Did you know that John MacArthur, yeah, I name names, has got a license from the Dewey Lockman Foundation. The Dewey Lockman Foundation, Dewey Lockman was the man who wanted a fresh translation of the Bible. He wanted to update the, the old King James English, take out the these and thous, and, and just kind of modernize the language. But that's not what happened. Uh, he invited a scholar friend of his. In fact, they were very close friends, a guy by the name of Frank Logsdon. And Frank Logsdon got involved in this translation process. When Frank Logsdon found out what, these, what the agenda of these Bible translators really was, after much prayer and consideration, he wrote a letter to Dewey Lockman, one of his best friends in the whole world, and said, I hate to do this, but I cannot in good conscience be a part of what these men are doing to God's word. And he said, I, I hate to do this as well, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around, once this Bible comes to the market, I'm going to go around to as many churches that will have me and warn them not to ever use the New American Standard Bible. Because it's full of lies. They've taken out a bunch of verses out of the New Testament that should be in there. 1 John 5, 7 is one of them. Acts 8, 37. And there's a bunch more prayer and fasting has gone out of these Bibles. And he said, I'm just going to go around and tell everybody that I know not to ever buy a New American Standard Bible. And if I've heard this from one preacher, I've heard it from a thousand of them. When I ask them, what Bible do you use? Well, I like the New American Standard Bible because it's the most literal to the Hebrew and Greek. They all say the same speech, brother. Brother, They give me the same line. Like, they, like what I know is, I know that they didn't study it out and come to the conclusion that, that it was the best one according to the Greek. They heard that line from somewhere and they just, they say that same thing. But John MacArthur worked a deal out with the, um, the Lockman Foundation with the New American Standard. They gave him a license to take the New American Standard and every place where the Bible calls God the Lord, they're going to take that out. Every place that it says that, they're going to take it out and they're going to replace it with this word Yahweh. Now, you have not ever read in your Bible that God's name is Yahweh, have you? No, you haven't. What you've heard or what you've read in your Bible in the King James is Jehovah. In fact, you know, how you, take a guess at how many times God's name Jehovah is in the King James Bible. Just take a wild guess. Seven times. Exactly seven times. Okay? But MacArthur is going to take that, take the Lord out. And so let's read that verse again. Uh, who, who at verse four, who have said with our own tongue, will we prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? So that just sounds a lot like what MacArthur's doing. And I want to tell you something based upon what Jesus said in Revelation, uh, Revelation 22 about adding and taking away from his word. I would not want to be John MacArthur on judgment day. I don't even want to be Mike Hoggard on judgment day. <laughs> But I definitely wouldn't be him. Look at verse 5. For the impression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord, and I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Now look at verse 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. Is that what your Bible says? Are? What form of speech is the word are? Present tense. So is your Bible right now pure words? That's what it says. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified how many times? Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So think about this now. You're in the 490th chapter, 70 times 7. 
And not only does it tell you that the words of the Lord are pure, it tells you they've been purified seven times. Let me just give you some more math for you, okay? 1611 minus 1604. That's real easy. That's seven years. In 1604, King James of England at the Hampton, uh, Hampton Court meeting, he was meeting with representatives of the Church of England and from the Puritan churches and all the scholars that he could find, and he issued a mandate. He said, I want a new translation of the Bible to be made as close to the original languages as possibly can, but with comparing the former translations along with it. That started in 1604 and it ended in 1611, seven years later. And those 54 men didn't just work on, they, they divided up in groups. One group, let's say they would have Genesis through Deuteronomy. Another group would have Joshua through 1 Samuel. Another group would have 2 Samuel through the Psalms and so on. And when they all got done with their group's translation work, then they took their work and their notes and gave it to group B. Group B gave its work to group C and they basically just pushed their work around the circle so that every group got to be in on the translation of every other group that was there to make sure that it wasn't too much Church of England, that it wasn't too much John Calvin's Puritan churches, that it was as close to the original Hebrew and Greek, comparing the former translations. Now, this is one thing that the enemies of the King James, and that's what I call them, because they are. They're enemies of the King James. That's one thing that they say. Well, the King James, they didn't even stick with the Hebrew and Greek. They used the previous translations. Take your Bible and turn to Second uh, Peter, if you would, please. And I want to show you why they did what they did. They took the Bishop's Bible, which is a Church of England Bible. They took the Geneva Bible, which was a Puritan Bible. They took uh, William Tyndale's translation. They took John Wycliffe's translation. They took Martin Luther's German translation. They had various translations from various languages. They had the Latin Vulgate, which they used. They tried to get as many different Bibles to compare because if God says something in English, then it stands to reason he should be saying the same thing in Spanish, German, Latin, Italian. Does that make sense to everybody? In other words, the Spanish people don't have a different Bible than we have. They got the same Bibles just translated into their tongue. So now look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed. And this is Peter. Peter just told everybody, I was there when God said, this is my beloved son. Peter said, I heard his voice. But he said, if you don't believe me, you don't have to. We have a more sure word of prophecy right here. And he said, um, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Now look at verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy, which means declaration of the scripture, is of any private, and what's that word? Interpretation. What does that word mean? Translation. The translators of the King James knew that they could not come up with a brand new, totally different translation of the Bible, that it had to match and yet improve upon the former translation. So in a lot of the, a lot of the King James Bibles that are printed by certain publishing houses, they leave in that, that front page on there that says authorized version, uh, translated from the original tongues with the former translations diligently compared and revised. It'll say that on there to let you know that they were following God's own rules, that they not come up with a completely unique translation, that it had to match and improve upon the previous translations. Now, uh, where was I going with that?
Seven days, seven days is 98 times seven times seven. Um, oh, I like this. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. The word cease is mentioned 70 times, finished 42 times, perfectly seven times. Oh, look at this one. The phrase end of the world is mentioned exactly seven times in the Bible. The end of the world. Um, the ends of the earth, 28 times, seven times four. Uh, here in the book of Revelation, we have sevens all in the book of Revelation. We have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven angels with the seven vials, uh, the seven last plagues. We have a beast with seven heads. We have a dragon with seven heads. All of those mean something. All of them uh, have to do with something. Uh, let's see. Oh, I like this. This is my favorite part here. God's title of most high, 49 times exactly. Seven times seven. God's title of Holy One, 49 times, 7 times 7. Uh, I'm going to skip through some of the God of Israel, 203 times, that's a multiple of 7. Lord God, 546, that's a multiple of 7. God Almighty, 11 times. Almighty God, 3 times, that's 14 times, 7 times 2. Jesus' title of King of Kings and Lord of Lords, 7 words all together. Okay? God in, uh, with the capital G... 4,081 times in your King James, that's a multiple of seven. Did man do that? There's no way that, there's no way that those 54 men working in that fashion could have made these numbers come out the way they did. The works of God, seven times. Power of God, 14 times. Mount and mountain of God, total seven times. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. That's mentioned seven times in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 1, there's a lineage of Jesus. It has 42 names in it. That's seven times six. In Luke chapter 3, it's a different lineage. It goes all the way back to Adam, who is the son of God. There's 77 names in that lineage. That's seven times 11. By the way, the word church is also mentioned 77 times. Now think about this for a minute. Think about this for a minute. Let's go back here. They give the lineage, starting from Christ, going backwards all the way to Adam, which the Bible says was the Son of God. So God is the, is the beginning of all of the lineage of Jesus Christ, and it ends in Jesus Christ. Now, when there is a lineage given... In the Old Testament law, it basically showed who owns the field, who owns the vineyard, who owns the property. So uh, Abraham gave his inheritance down to Isaac. Isaac gave his inheritance down to Jacob. Jacob down to the 12 tribes, and they split it off and so on and so on. And now Jesus is the one who is going to inherit all things. Amen? Because he is the Son of God, and there's the lineage to prove it. And yet... With the phrase, the church being mentioned 77 times, it's because we are joint heirs with Jesus. What he inherits, we're going to inherit. Amen? Oh, listen, how about, oh, I'll show you that. No, 77th chapter of the Bible talks about the tabernacle of the congregation. The word Passover or Passovers is mentioned exactly 77 times. Christ is our Passover. Mm. Romans 6 talks about being baptized. So the, all the words baptize, baptize, baptizes, baptizeth, baptizing 77 times all together. So think about it. Christ's lineage, 77 names. Church, 77 times. Passover, 77 times. All the forms of the word baptize, 77 times. Get ready for this one. The phrase, in Christ, exactly 77 times. And remember that the number 7 ends things, and the number 8 starts it all over again. So, if any man, this verse says, if any man be in Christ, think of the ark that Noah and his family was in. Did they hang on to the sides on the windows like this and say, I oh, hope we make it? Where were they? In the ark. The ark was Christ. They are in Christ. And look at what it says. If any man be in Christ, 77 times, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Seventh chapter of the Bible, all things are become new. Eighth chapter of the Bible with eight people. 
I told you when I started this, you're going to find some things you never thought was in the Bible. But they're there. They've been there for over 400 years. The word peculiar, seven times in the Bible, we're peculiar people. We are his workmanship, seven times. All of these words, witnesses, assembly, bride, first fruits, fishers, kinsmen, all of them, multiples of seven times. Daughter of Zion, 28 times. Daughter of Jerusalem, seven times. Children of Israel, 644 times, seven times, 92. The phrase kingdom of God, 70 times. And the word king with a capital K, 70 times exactly. Now, I had you go to, let's see, we put this up here. That was the 490th chapter of the Bible. Uh, let me see if I have it up here in my notes. Ah, yeah, I do. We, what, what did we say the 70th chapter of the Bible was? Exodus 20. And what's in Exodus 20? So seven times what makes 70? 10. And you're in the 70th chapter of the Bible and you have 10 commandments. Count, count the words of verse 1 of that chapter. Count the words of verse 1. Seven, seven words. All the people that are looking in their Bible, they got to look. I just said there's seven of them. Everybody else is going, there's seven of them. Yeah, I see it right there. You know what God did with me one time? He challenged me. I opened up to that chapter and, I, and God said, Mike, read verse 1. And God spake all these words saying. And God said, Mike, do you believe that? Now I knew what God was getting at. God was telling me to forget my Bible college teaching. That all the Bibles had mistakes in them. And just believe that God knows. Just imagine for a minute. What if God knew English? What if God knew how to speak English? What if God wanted to save a bunch of people that spoke English? What would he do? He would have his word translated in the language that they could speak. Amen. Amen? So when I read and God spake all these words saying... The Holy Ghost was saying, Mike, do you now believe that I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do you believe that I said all of those words in your language? And I said, yeah, God, I do. I do. I never thought of that, but I do. I believe it. In fact, let me give you this. What was, what was the first miracle of this church age? Pentecost and what did God do he sent his Holy Spirit down and all of those men started speaking in a language that they had never spoken before why were they doing that because there were people standing there who that was their language and God was sending word to the Jews who didn't believe and to all the Gentiles who would believe, don't worry. God will speak your language when he calls you. I was told, I don't know how many times I've sat in sermons under preachers who said, now the, the, Greek, the Greek is translated better here. Or this verse here, I don't like how it was translated. The original Greek translates it better as... And I was told that I had to go and look up the Greek all the time or look up the Hebrew all the time. And I'm like, now I'm like, wait till I get done digging all the English stuff out of it first. Then maybe I might start looking at some Greek. But I think there's lots of things in, the, in this book for you and I that are written to us in English. Amen. 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 It's, in fact, that I have a little teaching that I do. I may do this tomorrow night and give you the exact doctrine that I'm referring to. I'm not making this up. The, the Bible was given to us, first of all, in the original manuscripts, and those were inspired by God. God even shows us how those men had it. With Ezekiel, uh, a, a hand came down from heaven and had a scroll in it, and God said, Ezekiel, arise and eat, and he ate it. It was in his mouth sweet as, sweet as honey because the words of the Lord are sweet to us, okay? And then... Um, 
to like uh, Joshua, God said, Joshua, open your mouth and I will put my words in your mouth and then you go and speak what I said. So that's how God delivered the words, the exact words, not just the thoughts, but the very words from God went to those men, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So that's how those men in the original manuscripts. But was it just intended for the original manuscripts? No. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And he didn't say my words shall not pass. He said my words shall not pass away. That means none of them are going to end up being an error, being taken out, whatever. When I was in Bible college in 1984, I took Greek class in 85. So 1985, they gave me a Greek New Testament to learn from because I took Greek class. It was the 21st edition of what's called the Nestle Aland Greek text. It's the Greek text that all the new Bibles are based on, and it has all the verses that are missing out of these new Bibles are missing out of that Greek text. So they gave me a corrupt Greek text to begin with, but it was the 21st edition. Do you know what edition they're on now? Same Bible, same Greek text, 28th edition, which means that since 1985, they have changed that Greek New Testament seven times. So if you have a Bible, let's say you got an NIV and you got it back in 1987, and it was based upon what the Greek text said in 1987, then you need a new Bible because the Greek text is different now than it was in 1987. So now the publishing companies, the Bible publishers, have to come up with a newer version of their Bible to match the Greek text, which about is, it's about to roll over to the 29th edition. So it's always changing, is it not? Brother, would you pass this around and let folks look at it? How many of you have ever seen a 1611 King James Bible? Two people, three people. This is one here. Okay? Now, the spelling's different, but the words are exactly the same. I want you to look at it, and I want you to find your favorite verse, the one that you know by heart, and I want you to look it up in this Bible. I'll give you plenty of time. You can do that while I'm talking, okay? Because in uh, 1994, my wife and I drove all the way out to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, for a denominational meeting, national meeting, and the esteemed Greek professor from the esteemed denominational Bible college was going to uh, give a talk on the King James issue. And the first thing he said was, now, uh, those of you who say you believe the King James, do you believe the 1611 King James, or do you believe the 17 or the 1630 King James, or do you believe the 1729 King James? Now, at that time, I was on his side, and I'm like, yeah, it's been changed three times, hadn't it? And so he tried to make his point like, you don't know what Bible you, to believe in, because if you believe in this King James, it's not the same as the original 1611 King James. And I believed him because he said it. And, and he's a scholar, a professor. He's big in the denomination. Why would he lie about it? To this day, I don't know why the man lied, but he did. My wife bought for me a smaller version of that very book right there. Gave it to me for my birthday. And I started reading it and I started crying. Because I was reading Isaiah 53. By his stripes we are healed. And I was reading that from the 1611 Bible, and it matched perfectly the Bible that I had in my hand. I started reading Matthew. I started reading Revelation. I started reading Galatians. Places that I knew. John 3.16, that's an easy one. And you're going to find that it's the exact same. So while the new translations, the NIV has been HIV. <laughs> I heard that. 
I heard that. I'm, uh, I'm not NIV positive. I just thought I'd let you know. Um, NIV has been changed significantly since 1973, five times. And if you have a current NIV Bible, then you have the gender neutral NIV Bible that they tried to push on everybody in this country back in the 90s. And then everybody in this country in the 90s pushed back and said, We're not, we don't want that Bible. So they said, fine. They didn't get rid of it. They just slowly, how does a serpent move? You never know he's there. And so they just, over time, incorporated the gender neutral language into the current NIV Bible that's out on the market right now. He enticed Eve, yep. And, and, and Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Paul said the same way the devil lied to Eve is the same way he'll lie to you. Just little bits and pieces. And you know what the devil never told Eve to do? He never even told her to go eat that fruit. He never said that. He never told her that. She did it on her own, but she believed the lie. All right. Um, I got to show you one or two more things here. The phrase, Word of God, 49 times, 7 times 7. That's what got me started, brother. It was I pulled that up. I thought it would be some other number, and I saw 49. I'm going, I don't know what 49 is. And I, I just kind of dozed off a little bit. And I, when I woke up, I went, that's seven times seven. And that's what got me going, counting these things in the Bible. Um, oh, man. Um, let me show you this, and I'm gonna, we're going to change. Okay, the name Jesus, 980 times, which is 490 times two. That's 70 times seven times two. Now, think about what we learned about 70 times 7. It's about the forgiveness of his brethren, Israel. So when Jesus came the first time and offered them 70 times 7, they didn't want it. He's coming again. Amen. When I do this, that means, amen, preacher, we agree with you. We're on the same page. Amen. Okay. And if I do this and you don't say anything, it means you're in a completely different book, all right? He's coming again, and he's going to save his brethren 70 times 7. So his name is in there 70 times 7 times 2, 980 times. His title of Son of Man is in the Bible 196 times. That's 49 times 4. His name, Jesus Christ, is in there also 196 times, 49 times 4. Now, what am I holding in my hand? A Bible, but what, what kind of object is this? Is it a tree? Is it a boat? It's a book. It's a book. So if I showed you a, 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 a verse in the Bible that had the word book in it, you would know that I'm referring to the Bible. So, this is in Isaiah. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. What am I talking about? The Bible. Amen. You know how many times the word book is in the King James Bible? 196 times. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, come on. That blew my thunder, man. There it is. 196 times, same number as Jesus Christ, same number as Son of Man. Now, here's how I, here's how I equate this so people can understand. So let's say you, uh, you come out of a store and you look down and you notice there was a dime on the, on the sidewalk in front of you. So you bent over and picked up a dime. Somebody lost a dime, you stuck it in your pocket. You take 10 steps down the sidewalk and all of a sudden there's a dime laying there. Huh, 
Somebody's dropping money. So you bend down, pick up the dime, put it in your pocket. But when you take 10 more steps, there's another dime there. By the time you get to the third dime, you've already, you know that you've walked 30 paces to get to that. Every 10 steps, there's a dime. You put it in your pocket. You go down 10 more steps, there's a dime. You put it in your pocket. And every time you go 10 steps, there's a dime on the, and you're looking around like, am I on candy camera? Is this going to be on YouTube or, or something? Because you know that somebody is deliberately putting dimes every 10 steps on the sidewalk. It's not an accident. It can't be unless somebody just by chance is pulling money out of their pocket and a dime falls and it just happens to do that every 10 steps and it does it a hundred times. Now you've got, what's a hundred times 10? And you've got a thousand dollars or a thousand cents. You got, yeah, you got $10. So you have this money in your pocket and you did it because you know that every 10 steps there's gonna be another dime and you know that somebody is doing this deliberately. So when I started finding these patterns in the Bible, it dawned on me after I found so many of them, this can't be just chance. It can't be. Somebody did this deliberately. And the only person that I could think of that could do something like this is God. Amen.